So this is the talk. This is advanced physical security beyond dumpster diving and social engineering or screw the firewall and the secretary too, which is the alternate title that didn't make it into the program. Now, this talk is predicated on the idea that what, do we, what can we do if all we care about is the information at the end of the rainbow? What happens if we don't care about looking like Lee Taxos to our friends? What happens if we don't care about breaking the law? What happens if all we want is the information and we don't care how we get it? Now, first a bit about myself. I'm a member of Tool, which is the open organization of lock pickers. You may have already guessed this by my t-shirt. If you come up to Lock Pick Village, we will happily teach you how to pick locks. It should be open at some point. I don't know if it's open right now, because we're probably at this talk. I'm a student at the Massachusetts Institute of, Institute of Technology, or as the Boston Herald has called it, the Massachusetts Institute of Terrorism. Now, I'm a comparative media studies major, which has nothing to do with any of all this, so I can't cl lay claim to any kind of academic credential. In fact, most of the time, I'm one of these. You've probably already guessed by my taking pictures of the audience obsessively. This generally doesn't overlap with security, except when I do portraits like this one, or perhaps shoot one of these. And I do a whole lot of lock photography because while I'm a lock guy, in fact, if you want to look at lock porn, just go to ericschmino.com slash locks. I have a whole lot of lock pictures up there for your enjoyment. Now, the reason you actually came here was not to hear, hear me talk about myself, it was to hear about the talk. And the reason I thought, started doing, thinking about doing this talk is the realization that hacking is becoming more commercialized, not because people are getting hired to protect systems, but because information thieves have figured out that information often obtained through hacking is this great way to make money. Now, remember, this is about the information. It's not about the hacking, which means that as computer systems become more and more secure, of course, they're never be going to become secure, otherwise DEF CON's going to be out of business, and it's never going to happen. As the computer systems become more and more secure, there's greater and greater incentive to get the information by any means necessary, which means doing whatever it takes, which does not necessarily mean hacking. This means that we can take advantage of the fact of, say, the fact that you and everybody else around you are the weakest link. Social engineering people love to drive this point home with cool demos at Hope and the social engineering talk, which I'm sure you guys all went to. But in reality, the problem with social engineering is that, well, you have to lie and you have to lie convincingly, and not everybody's going to believe your lies. So what happens when social engineering doesn't work? Well, if social engineering doesn't work and you can't get, them, get someone inside the organization to tell you the information because they believe you to be somebody you aren't, you might as well pretend to be somebody you aren't and get them to formally become a spy for you by recruiting them as a spy. Now, half of you guys are thinking, great, awesome idea, really cool. I'm going to go recruit spies and all the cool companies get all their cool data. And the other half of you are thinking, well, great idea, but not a lot of people like to spy. And the solution to this is the process of recruiting spies. It's been formalized over many decades by many intelligence agencies. And it basically boils down to subtly, as James Jesus Angleton, CIA counterintelligence director, at one point so elegantly put it, subtly entrapping them in this web of irresistible compromises so that while they start out not realizing that they're a spy by the end, they know they're a spy and they realize they don't really have much choice in the matter. Actually recruiting them as a spy is a five-step process with the sixth step added in for the slash dot trolls. And first of all, you want to spot the potential recruit, figure out who your target is. You want to do your homework, get all the background information you can on them, figure out what their habits are and such. You want to get access to them in a way that you can actually go up and talk to them and they won't think you're some weirdo. You want to develop them as a crew to get them more and more into the game, and then finally recruit them as a spy. Now, what you're looking for in many cases, in all cases in fact, is either somebody who has access to the information that you want, or someone who can get you access to the people who have themselves access to the information that you want. These are called access agents. You also want to make sure that the people that you're looking at recruiting aren't counter spies who are going to either feed you with false information or send the cops. Now, once you've identified someone who's a plausible spy or seems like a good idea, you want to learn about them. This means learning what makes them tick. Why do they do what they do? Are they in it for the money? Are they in it because they're, they believe in the organization they're working for? Or are they in it because they're, they just want to help people? And then from this, you can figure out why it is that they're going to work for you. Now, why, some, why should someone work as a spy for some random sketchy person that's asking them to pass on information they really shouldn't be passing on? Well, there's a whole bunch of reasons. First of all, because you're offering, offering them a whole crap ton of cash. People like money. 
and people are willing to do a lot of stuff for money. So that, that's one of the common reasons. But also, some, maybe they want to get revenge on somebody. Maybe, maybe they want to get revenge on the boss who's been bossing them around and really been treating them like crap. Passing on information that's going to help take down that person is a great way for them to get back at them, and you can take advantage of that. Maybe they want to get revenge on their government. Maybe they're really, they're really dissatisfied with the political system that they work in, or maybe they're dis dissatisfied with the company they're, par they're part of. If they work for Walmart, well, maybe they don't like Walmart very much, and you can take advantage of this fact. Maybe you can put them in a blackmail or hostage situation where they're passing on information to protect their reputation or protect their family. Maybe, they're, maybe they'll spy for national pride if you can pretend to be from the government that they were, of the country they were originally born in, if they're proud of that country and they're working somewhere else or working for some other country, you can take advantage of this by pretending to be from that government, or maybe you actually are. Um, you can get them emotionally involved if they're in a really boring, humdrum, day-to-day -day job with no excitement. Spying can add a lot of excitement to their life, and one of the reasons that some people spy. If they're naive, you can convince them that they're working for some great cause, working for peace. Uh, that was one of the favorite lines of the KGB back in the day to people who are working in the West. Well, pass on information on, on whatever defense activity you're involved in, and you'll be helping the cause of world peace. Well, that's great if you're really naive. Um, people will pass on information as long as they get laid. People are willing to do a lot for getting, in exchange for getting laid. And passing on information is one of these things. And, of course, ideology. Again, the KGB loved this. Back in the 1930s in Cambridge, some of you guys are perhaps aware, they talked to a couple of very clever Cambridge students in England and persuaded them these were pretty serious communists, that they should renounce communism publicly and get jobs in the British government, passing on information to the so into the Russians. One of these guys was H.A.R. Kim Philby, John Cairncross, some of these pe other people caused an enormous amount of damage because they were incredibly effective and they were just working because they believed that communism really was the answer. Now, the other kind of agent you might want to recruit is an access agent. This is somebody who can get you access to somebody who can pass it on information that you want. This means that somebody who has connection to the target group, perhaps, hopefully they work for the same company, the same organization, but perhaps they just go to the, they just hang out at the same bar, member of the same club, but could just be a prostitute, a high-class call girl who you're, pr who you're paying a lot of money to pretend that there's some kind of some, something going on that really isn't, or make an introduction. The job of this access agent is to figure out for you who has access to the information you want. This of oftentimes isn't public information. The job of an access agent could be to make an introduction. Perhaps you want to be pretending to be from some government and you want them to introduce you as if you're from that government, as if you're actually a secret agent when you're really some random hacker. Or it could just be to have sex. Because let's face it, people trust people they have sex with. And I mean, this, is, this has been taken advantage of many, many times. Everybody knows how this works, but few people know the actual details. And how the KGB would do it, for example, if a Western businessman was, mis was visiting Soviet Russia and the KGB knew that this guy had access to information they wanted, sometime, perhaps he might, get, he might run into some very cute, pretty girl at a bar, and they would start talking, and one thing would lead to another, they would go back to her room, her apartment, or some hotel room, and they would have sex, maybe a couple of times, and then the Western businessman would go back home. And a few days, a few weeks later, he would get a distraught letter from this girl being like, oh my God, I'm pregnant. My f if my father finds out about this, he's going to kill me, like literally kill me, like string me up and hang me kind of deal. They're Russians, they're really brutal. You've got to help me. I'm in deep shit. I'm going to lose my job. My life's going to hell. You're responsible for this. You've got to help me. And by the way, my friend, you know, Normally, like, Russia, so abortions are totally legal in Soviet Russia, but I've got this friend, he's, he's with the KGB, he's got connections, he can get me an abortion, but he needs a reason to do this, so can you please just give him something a little bit so you can go to his boss and get them to give me an abortion? Well, sometimes w this was a nice, upstanding, honest businessman who would happily give a little bit of information to rescue his one-time Soviet girlfriend. If he wasn't, well, that hotel room, that apartment happened to be set up by the KGB for, with video cameras and microphones to make some very, very nice home movies that the KGB would then hold over the businessman and threaten to expose to his wife, which could be very persuasive. Unfortunately, this only really worked one, one time, maybe twice. And the, West, the East Germans were a bit more clever than the KGB, and they realized that a long-term emotional relationship with the target could get a whole lot more and a whole lot more useful intelligence than a quick encounter. So they invented the concept of the Romeo spy. This was a smooth-talking guy, usually, whose job it was to make 
contact with some secretary who had access to top level, high security information, generally in the West German government, and get into a relationship with her, get her to bed, because let's face it, this was Germany after the Second World War, there weren't a lot of guys around, a lot of these secretaries were very lonely, and so some, some nice looking guy who seemed pretty cool, well, they started dating them, and in many cases they got married. And so for decades and decades and decades, these secretaries would either be passing on a bit of information to their husbands that they thought was totally innocuous because, well, their boyfriend or their husband, or perhaps even the romantic interest was able to recruit them formally to spy for the Soviet Union. Of course, we don't have this luxury. Most people don't. So how generally recruitment works in the world of espionage, if you're not talking about sex, is two ways. There is the nice way and there's the mean way. The nice way is you get to know them, establish some kind of friendship, and over the course of the friendship you ask for some kind of innocent or innocuous favor that you then reward generously, generally with lots and lots of cash. And this happens over and over again until the target gets so used to getting your cash for doing little favors, getting you little bits of information that they can do getting you, telling you when there's going to be some big news happening so you can buy or sell stock or whatever, that they come to depend on this money that you're giving them. And the more they come to depend on this money that you're giving them, the, the more you can ask for, until finally you ask them for something that's over the line. Not a lot over the line, just a little bit over the line, like the internal company phone book, something that would give you information that you really shouldn't have. And you pay them a crap ton of money for this on some, some kind of so some kind of pretense. For perhaps you're asking them for some plans which will allow you to thwart a terrorist attack, quote unquote. And, as a, and of course that's you know, logical and they want to help their government thwart a terrorist attack, right? So they think, well, I should, okay. And there's, big, there's good money in it, so they do it. At this point, you've got them hooked and you can recruit them. The mean way of doing this, on the other hand, this is what happens a lot in foreign countries when someone goes to visit these days, make their life hell get them arrested, get them in some kind of really deep shit that they have to get their way out of somehow and there's no obvious way of doing it. Maybe they got, maybe they got involved with some convenient woman who now turns out to be an enemy agent and now they're at risk of losing their clearance or whatever. And so you approach them and you offer to fix their life. Perhaps get them out of jail by, you know, knowing, by having the connections, but all they gotta do is pass on a little bit of information so you can satisfy your superiors. Once that happens, you can wash, rinse, repeat the steps I told you about earlier, get them to pass on more and more information until finally you can make the pitch. Recruit them formally as a spy for, or for your organization or for some plausible organization that doesn't actually exist. And when approached like this, of course, a lot of people, they refuse. People don't really want to be spies in many cases. And so it might be necessary to have a folder there with lots of incriminating photos of all the stuff they've been doing for you that could get them in really deep shit if they don't play along and don't keep doing what you want. How does this work in practice? Well, these are, there's a whole lot of tools that I just told you about, and things don't always get used so much, sometimes other things get used. It's a question of adapting to the particular situation. Like the KPMG, Guy and Wright Diligence Incorporated thing that happened a while ago. Um, a private investigation firm, it's a firm called Diligence Incorporated. Okay, this piece is retarded. If anybody has any idea how to get little snitch from throwing up boring dialogues about um, NMBD trying to connect out, I'd love to hear it. Anyway, so this private investigation firm, Dulles Incorporated, was hired to get some dirt on this other company, the IPOC International Growth Fund. And Dulles did some digging and figured out that IPOC, the target company, was being audited by this huge international accounting firm, KPMG. So they figured, well, the best way to get some dirt on IPOC, which has really good security, is to get a spy inside KPMG, which doesn't have such good security. So they sent down two ladies from their New York office to Bermuda, which is where the, IP which is where the audit is taking place. And these two young ladies pretended to be from a very high-powered, high-end, well-known New York law firm called White and & Case. And they contacted KPMG's Bermuda offices saying, hey, we're planning this legal conference. Can we get some list? Can we get a list of your employees in the area who we should contact for this legal conference? And KPMG did, th did their digging and figured out that this law firm was legit, and they sent along a list of employees for diligence to use, it, well, white in case to use 
in the course of planning their legal conference, which was actually figuring out who they wanted to spy for them. They looked at this list, ran through the usual databases, which will tell them anything and everything. It's amazing what you can get these days. And figured out that, well, there was nobody in KPMG's Bermuda office who had access to the information on IPOC who would actually be an ideal match for their profile of like an ideal spy, some presumably some guy in his mid-20s who liked risk and liked to gamble and liked women and sports and probably needed some money. There was just one guy, a British-born accountant named Guy Enright. And so a couple days later, Guy Enright gets a call from a guy claiming to be Nick Hamilton. Nick Hamilton speaks in a clipped, very high-end, high-class British accent. And he, he says he needs to meet Guy Enright for a matter of the utmost importance. That's all he says. A couple days later, they meet for lunch. And Nick Hamilton, who, by the way, is actually Nick Day, the co-founder of Diligence Incorporated and a former British agent for real, but not a current British agent at all, says that he wants to recruit Guy Enright for a matter concerning British national security. But he can't say any more. He first needs to do some background investigation work on Enright. So he hands Guy this official looking form, asks for all its personal information, political affi affiliations, cre credit history, you name it, back criminal history, and gets guy, guy to fill out the form, goes away, and a couple of days later meets Guy and Wright in the bar. And they, sit, they sit down, have a couple of beers. Uh, Nick Hamilton tells a couple of war stories from back when he was part of the British equivalent, uh, equivalent of the Navy SEALs, which may or may, or may or may not have been the case. And after an hour or two, gets down to business, says, well, Guy Ann Wright's been inspected, detected, infected, and finally selected for the mission, passed all the clearance checks, and what does Guy Enright know about the KPMG audit of IPOC? Simple question. And pretty soon, Guy Enright has agreed to start passing over information to his mother country, at least what he thinks is his mother country, about this audit. And so to maintain operational security, Nick Hamilton says, well, I've set up this thing. It's called a dead drop, so you don't ever have to meet me again. All you do is put the documents in this watertight container under this rock in a field this field happens to be on, uh, on the path of your daily commute every day, and I'll pick them up and leave some money or leave, some, leave something for you there, and we'll keep this up. And so this, this works for a couple of months. Nick, uh, Nick Hamilton tells Guy Enright, leaves me little notes or whatever, what information he wants. Guy Enright copies the documents or brings documents, leaves them in the watertight box, and Nick Hamilton picks them up. Some other point. This would have worked great. And it would never be have been discovered except for one minor problem. Somebody, we don't actually know who, left a packet of documents, internal diligence incorporated documents, at the KPMG New Jersey offices. These documents contained all the details on this little thing they called Project Yucca, which was the whole IPOC spy thing. And KPMG wasn't so happy about it. In fact, they filed suit and documents became public and we, we learned a couple of things as, as well as what was going on. We also know that, for example, Diligence wasn't very trusting of Guy Ann Wright. They figured they wanted to make sure he wasn't a, a KPMG counter spy, so they followed him to and from every meeting. And to make sure that Nick Hamilton wasn't being followed, every time he went, went to and from a meeting, he would walk this predefined path through Bermuda where he would walk past several, check, several choke points where diligence operatives could make sure there's nobody following him. We also know that while diligence was being paid $25,000 a month for this operation, which was very effective, all Guy Enright got, in addition to being publicly humiliated, was a Rolex watch. Now, if you're not diligence incorporated, perhaps you don't want to recruit, and maybe you don't want to recruit a spy inside the organization, perhaps you just want to send one of your own guys into the organization. This is a really popular tactic for use by, that corporations use and the government uses to infiltrate political, co political protest groups. They send in some guy who's got long hair who starts volunteering and helping out and starts passing out information on what, what, where the next protest is going to be. Um, a very successful example of this is Mary Lou McVeigh. This is a story that broke pretty recently about this woman who infiltrated the entire anti-gun movement and was actually an agent for the NRA. If you Google her, you can find out lots of cool information. On the other hand, how you shouldn't do it is what this other private investigation firm called C2I International did, and send a guy into this British anti-aviation group called Plain Stupid. 
said his name was Ken Tobias, said he really didn't like aviation, he just came in from China, and man, Heathrow Airport was really annoying. If he wanted to do anything, he could to hurt them. He was a really enthusiastic guy, really wanted to get more, make the group more radical, really wanted to get everybody to you know, take, take more risks and live life to the fullest and all that. But they got a little suspicious because not only was he really enthusiastic, and, but he was really clean cut, looked kind of like you'd ex exactly expect an undercover cop to look. And well, he showed up for meetings 10 minutes early, and if that isn't a warning sign, I don't know what is. <laughs> so they did some digging, and they figured out that even though he claimed to live in London, he wasn't on the London electoral register. And well, he claimed to have played rugby. He wasn't on the record of the rugby team he said he played for. So they fed him some fake information, figured whether this guy was actually a spy. And pretty soon, the exact tactics that they said they were going to use in this protest against airports were distributed to all, the to all the British airport security checkpoints as things to watch out for. And then, of course, the Manchester Evening Standard published all the details of the meetings that he'd attended. So they figured they had a rat. They sat him down in a Jap Japanese restaurant and asked him, you know, or at least could he verify his identity. So he said, well, uh, you know, I, uh, I just lost my wallet, and with my, that was my ID was in there, too. And, you know, my passport's at my mom's, and she lives a long way off, but, like, you're, perse you're persecuting me. You're persecuting me because of my background. And he got really whiny and emo, and so they kicked him out. <laughs> and they still realized, despite all this, they knew he was a spy, but they didn't know who, who, who he worked for. They did, some, they did some investigation. They took a picture of him at a protest. And since he said he'd gone to Oxford, he, they gave the picture to some guy they knew at Oxford who recognized him as Toby Kendall, a completely different person who the, whose name they Googled, which brought up a Bebo page. The Bebo page linked to a LinkedIn page which identified him as an analyst at the special risk management company, C2I International, and apparently he was involved in security and investigations. So if you're gonna be a spy, whatever you do, don't make sure your social networking pages don't reveal who you are. <laughs> Other thing you can do is get a job as a temporary employee. The classic example of this is construction workers who are pretty transient to begin with. And a construction worker on the night shift filling his, lun his lunch box with a couple of radio transmitters and a whole bunch of microphones can work pretty much unsupervised doing whatever the heck he wants, which makes for a night shift full of a whole lot of fun. If you want to get physical access to the facility, well, there's a couple things you can do. First of all, people are pretty polite. If, even if it's a security or chances are they're going to hold the door open for somebody who looks legit. So you can take advantage of this. If this is a building which is protected by photo IDs, photo IDs are notoriously vulnerable. In fact, there was a case some time ago where the guy in charge of physical security at a military base, which used only guards checking photo IDs as their security, figured he'd test his own base security. So he called up a couple of friends of his who worked in military intelligence, told them, hey guys, I'll buy you a whole night of beers if you can go, if you pick up these badges I've had made up for you, and all you, all you gotta do is get into work every day for two solid weeks and not get found out. Well, these special badges replaced the, picture, the photo ID picture on the badge with that of your average African baboon, and not only did this guy have to eat, buy a whole night of beers for these guys because they got in for two solid weeks, these badges weren't discovered for two solid months. And the only reason they were discovered is because the guard was, butter, was a Butterfingers and dropped one of the badges. And when he bent down to pick it up, he finally took a look at the picture <laughs> and said, hey, we've got a problem here. <laughs> now, if it's a secure door, there's this thing called the request to exit sensor. In theory, this is designed to allow people who are leaving the facility to open the door because it automatically unlocks the door when the motion detector gets set off. In reality, this is a great way for an attacker to get in and save the attacker the trouble of picking the lock because all he has to do is inflate a balloon un under the door tied to a rope, let it float up and wave it around until the motion sensor goes off and the door unlocks for him. Um, depending on the door mechanism, you can bypass in a wide variety of ways that don't involve lock picking. Um, you can slide Lloyd or card the door. You've seen this in movies, James Bond doing this. In, in many cases, the lock has this thing called the dead latch. Uh, my laser pointer doesn't work, but you can see the arrow. The dead latch is designed to prevent you from sticking a card in the jam and pushing back the latch. Unfortunately, not only are not all lock sets equipped with this feature, but many strike plates were installed by incompetent locksmiths who installed the wrong kind of strike plate, which means the dead latch doesn't work and you can still card the door. Some lock sets, of course, you can go in through the keyway, 
not pick the lock, but instead stick a wire into the right place and trip the latch because it's accessible from the back of the keyway and open the lock. And this is the Adams right bypass, for example, some photos. The idea is that the wire goes back in and just literally flips the bolt back and the lock and the door opens. In many cases, electronic locks have a lot of vulnerabilities. There's plenty of talks on this. This, for example, is a scramble keypad. It's highly secure because the keys change every time you enter the combination, so you never know what key was pressed if you were, say, watching with a camera. On the other hand, some, ki some keypads aren't quite so secure. For example, you can take some highlighter, which the highlighter ink stays pretty tacky for a long time, but also isn't visible in normal light. So if you light it up under UV, you can see the ink getting tracked from key to key and figure out what the, co what the combination is. Of course, sometimes you don't even need highlighter because, say, with fingerprint sensors, you can sometimes just breathe on the sensor, and the condensation will cause the fingerprint to register to the electronics. Now, I'm not even alum, so I'm not going to talk about lockpicking, but if you go up to Lockpicking Village, we will happily teach you how to do this. There is one thing I do want to mention on a side note is master key systems. Well, if you get access to one of the keys in a master key system, this could be the key to the bathroom in a skyscraper, which happens to be on the same master key system as the rest of the, the locks in the skyscraper. You can then take an impression of this key or decode the key. And assuming you can get blanks or make keys out of credit cards, as Mark Tobias showed us, uh, you can then make seven different keys, or six different keys, or five different keys, depending on how many different pins are in the lock. Go back to the skyscraper, and then if over the course of trying all these different keys, cutting them down in a certain way, derive the master key, which will allow you to open every lock in the whole building, and all you needed was the bathroom key, which you got by asking the receptionist. One thing you shouldn't do is tape over the locks in the building, hoping that you can get in at the end of the day. This is how the Watergate burglars were caught. A uh, former CIA guy who really should have known better, his name was James McCord, he put duct tape on the stairwell locks leading out of the Watergate building, the idea being that everybody could come back in, that the whole bugging team could come back in at the end of the day and bug the offices without having to pick the locks, which were apparently somewhat of a bitch. Well, this $9 an hour security guard, Frank Willis, saw the duct tape and was like, huh, so while well, making his daily rounds of the building. So he pulled off the duct tape and he continued on his way. And James McCord, who really needed a handy beating with a clue bat, came back, saw the duct tape had been removed, and put some more on the door. Well, so security guard comes back in an hour, he's duct tape had been added and calls the cops. Well, they found the Watergate bugging team in the offices of the Democratic National Party, and they were not in the offices of the Democratic National Party chairman, which was in fact the target. The reason was the Democratic chairman's office was really secure, had some good locks on it, and they really couldn't get in. They were in the adjacent office, and when the Washington DC police found them, they had the ceiling tiles removed. As it turns out, all that security in the Democra Democratic chairman's office was pointless because you could go in over the dropped ceiling and get into the office that way. If you don't want to play Watergate burglar, you can try a little more legal approach. In many, place, in many places, if you can get legit access to the neighboring building, a pair of binoculars or a long telephoto lens will get you this kind of view of what, whatever's going on in the office you're looking at. As it, and as a result, if you can see the screens, you can see what's on them, you might as well be running some kind of, I don't know, other attack, which I'm going to talk about later. This is incidentally a photo uh, as a result of a present, there was uh, some preparations for my friends, some friends of mine did. They did some research on, it, on the MBTA, that's the Boston Transit System uh, headquarters. This is a photo through the window of the MBTA operations building, which is terribly secure. There's, no, there's not even a front desk. It's all locked down. The security cameras all over the place. But, well, you can just look through the window. But nobody ever expects anyone to look through a skyscraper window, right? If you can get a cell phone into the building, because this is one of this is a kind of society where now all, now all of a sudden everybody's carrying their own bugging devices, there's two websites for about 100 euros a piece. They will sell you pre-manufactured, pre-coded, pre-compiled software, which will turn most cell phones into bugging devices that will dial out and let you listen to in on whatever is happening in the room in which the cell phone is left. The classic application of this is the businessman who is in the middle of some difficult contract negotiations, sit, sitting in the, in, the, in the conference room, and he's got his cell phone out on the table, his briefcase out on the table. He's like, hey, guys, 
Um, let's take a break. I gotta use, go use the bathroom. He goes use the bathroom, and you know, I don't know, maybe he has some diarrhea or something because he's gone for about 15, 20 minutes. And at the same time, his cell phone is in fact recording whatever, the, whatever his negotiating adversaries are talking about in the room while he's listening in or hearing from a compatriot who's summarizing everything, everything he needs to know to go in and have a much greater advantage in the nego negotiating table. Of course, some cell phones aren't so easy to get access to, like Carl Rove's iPhone. As it so turns out, though, the iPhone has a number of remote vulnerabilities. If you Google Rick Farrow iPhone, you can figure out how to remotely boot an iPhone. And as Rick Farrow demonstrates, you can easily upload some software which will cause the iPhone to send you an audio recording of whatever is going on around the iPhone. I would sure love to hear what's going around in Carl Rove's iPhone if any, anybody can get me in. <laughs> of course, the problem with all this is it's really illegal. Uh, wiretapping laws and <laughs> audio interception laws have, have been around for a while, and this is the kind of stuff which, as Office Space put it, is not going to send you to a white collar resort prison, it's going to send you to federal pound me in the ass prison. Um, for example, in, in, the, in the U.S. it's illegal to possess, manufacture, distribute devices which are primarily useful for the surreptitious interception of wire, oral, or electronic communications. Got to wonder if it was that little keyboard key loggers that I bought off eBay, if I said it, whether it's illegal. Um, of course, this could in extend to something as innocuous as your average intercom. Radio Shack sells these intercoms which are designed for communicating from room to room or listening in on like what's happening like with a baby mono type thing plug them into the wall, and you plug everyone into the wall, and somehow some magic happens, and over the power line, the audio goes and gets extracted, and you can listen to it. Well, anybody using an HF band ham radio can hear that too. Um, anybody who goes online and buys himself one of these little uh, handy-dandy recording device, little audio recorders, I mean, they're marketed at recording meetings. They just don't say what kind of meeting and how the recording's being done. They advertise features like capturing audio of meetings, interviews, and other critical information expected of digital recorders with featuring amazingly long recording times of 136 hours with on up to 32 hours of continuous operation, even featuring a timer recording mode for those who do not, do not want to call attention to the fact that they're making a recording. Uh, sounds really useful to me. <laughs> mm -hmm. Parental protection, yeah, there you go. Of course, your voicemail, if even if you don't want to drop in with a recorder, is kind of vulnerable sometimes. Most voicemail mailboxes are protected by a numeric code, which has no at all, no precautions against brute forcing. Your lens cap is on, dude. Um, <laughs> yeah, I'm a photographer. I can't. Uh, no protections against brute, brute forcing. And think what kind of messages people are leaving on, on your voicemail and what those messages are going to say about you. Speaking of things that, that t give you more, g uh, give the adversary more information than you might have desired, if you want to get information on this top secret presentation, the CEO is giving perhaps, perhaps the board of directors, and you know it's going to be held in a very secure room, and you know there's going to be a counter surveillance sweep team going through looking for bugs, so you find one to plant, plant a bug, it would be awfully nice if you could get a bug on the CEO's person. This, of course, the problem with this is you've got to get access to the CEO's clothes, and that could be kind of a problem. So really, you'd much rather if the CEO just up and volunteered to carry in a bugging device for you, like one of these. This is your average conference body pack wireless microphone. And these things are so vulnerable to interception that the reason I'm walking around with a microphone up here on stage, like Elvis Presley, as opposed to carrying a little lavalier mic, is because in the past people have started broadcasting on the, on the frequency at DEF CON and giving their own talks over the presenter. <laughs> Get a little more advanced if you like with Bluetooth, key loggers, PBX, voice over IP, I'll talk about that a bit later. But when it comes down to it, these are the kind of attacks where really you're, you end up parking a van outside, out in front, one that hopefully doesn't look too suspicious and looking at what, what comes out of the target facility, perhaps from a bug. You don't even have to plant a bug. There's this thing called Tempest. This was discovered back in the 80s, uh, the, also known as Van Eck freaking. This guy named Wim Van Eck discovered that your average CRT emanates the kind of information that all, you, that all you need is a specially designed radio receiver, and you can reconstruct all the information on that CRT and watch as someone is typing in all the secret plans and whatever. Well, LCDs are a little bit more difficult to intercept like this, so great excuse to tell your boss to buy you that cinema display you've always wanted because it's immune to Tempest. 
at least in theory. On the other hand, there's other stuff that's going on in your average office which is a little less secure, like say the Microsoft Optical Wireless 1000, 2000 keyboards. It's transmitted on 27 megahertz, which means it'll go through lots and lots of buildings and obstructions like 900 megahertz won't. And they use an incredibly secure encryption technique called XOR. And as it turns out, they only use one of 256 possible keys. And this Swiss security research firm called Dream Lab figured out that, well, not only can you intercept one keyboard, but if you have three separate keyboards next to each other, you can filter out key, filter them all by keyboard, and on your screen, watch three different keyboards being used simultaneously, or more. Of course, Bluetooth isn't really safe either. This is a quick shortcut link to a Bluetooth paper talking about the fine art of causing Bluetooth connection to be interrupted, causing the repairing process to happen, at which point you can snarf some keys and get some interesting information. Uh, this is a little bit beyond the scope of this talk, so I'll leave it up to you and your research skills. Phone tapped, classic example, everybody knows. I'm hearing clicks on my phone, therefore they're tapping my phone. Well, these days phone taps are probably a little more sophisticated, unless there's actually a guy sitting outside tapping into your phone box with a lineman's handset. Like for example, Walmart, who not only did they configure their email system to look for any outgoing keywords which might suggest that one of their employees was communicating with a protest group or a reporter, they set up their PBX to automatically intercept and report, intercept and record calls coming to and from the New York Times because they're looking for a leak. Well, this got public when they fired a guy named Bruce Gabbard. He told his story to the media and Walmart wasn't so happy. You can do this too if you want. If you go online, you can get all sorts of hidden cameras and hidden microphones for a nominal fee. These things aren't terribly secure when it comes to resistance to bug thiefing teams. But let's face it, if you can hide a camera in a birdhouse, a clock radio, potted plants, teddy bear, glasses, even a hair dryer. And of course for 700 bucks, even if, if you're in just in case your cell phone camera wasn't good enough, you can get a cell phone wireless video camera. This is I think the, the first example I've ever seen of meta cameras, which are a camera hidden inside a device that already cons contains a camera. <laughs> yes, recursion. So what do you do with this kind of video? Well, there's the usual incriminating footage. There we go. Like happened in Sandridge Elementary School. This is a case from which the principal here was videotaped from a hidden camera that was concealed in the, in the ceiling of his, of his camera. Ah, getting tongue tied. This is a principal that was videotaped by a hidden camera concealed in the heating duct, heating duct above his office. It got some very interesting home movies that were held onto by this unknown party for a couple of months and then emailed out in DVD form to a couple of parents five days before the school board elections. This, this wreaked a lot of havoc and the cops were called in and they figured out that because there was no audio on the DVDs, they didn't fall under eavesdropping law and so they couldn't actually open an investigation into who did this. <laughs> but that's not all you can do with wireless video cameras. So, and okay, so I'll let you show, I'll let you see the, one of the cooler applications of this from, one of the, from, from the experts. This is one of the TV shows I would actually watch if it ever got back on the, if it ever got back on the air, called Tiger Team. On the way out, I planted a small wireless camera next to the alarm keypad so that we could watch it remotely from the hotel. And this is the alarm keypad, which controls the alarm system to a very high-end audio auto dealership. And this is what happened. You get to watch the thing, and, this, and for bonus points, can anybody guess where the camera was hidden? One more reason not to have lots of bling around your office. But I mean, let, let's face it, you can hide a transmitter pretty much anywhere. Uh, there's a case a while ago um, in, involving Air France and the Concorde. This was back when the Concorde was still running. The French, go the French government's inter intelligence arm bugged the first class seats in the Concorde. Every single one of them, they could listen to the conversations between businessmen who were flying to France to negotiate deals with French companies, and from this information, get something which would give an advantage to the French companies. Of course, you can hide a bug outside the room with lasers. Thanks to modern technology, you can bounce a laser off the window, record, take the reflected beam, read it with a $3 Radio Shack photo cell, plug it into an audio amplifier, and listen to whatever was going on inside the room. 
been around for a long time. This, the spooks have been using it for ages. It was recently featured on hackaday.com. Um, but NASA figured out that what if you use terahertz radio waves instead of a laser, you can listen to vibrations that are caused in metal objects in the room, like the laptop I'm talking to, in that it's in front of me, because the vibrations of the metal objects cause the beam to get modulated, and using a whole lot of DSP, you can listen to the vibrations in, in the metal object inside of the room, which means that the old trick of attaching a speaker to the window to defeat the laser bounce window listener no longer works. This, for your information, is patent number 2005022023310. If you look it up online, you can make your very own. Of course, once you've got this bug inside the room, what do you do? As it turns out, you can reconstruct anything that's typed on a computer keyboard from a microphone in the room. This research, which was done by uh, some researchers at UC Berkeley using a cheap $10 PC microphone, they figured out that not only do you can you read what the user is typing on the keyboard from the sound of the keys tapping, you don't even have to know what the, what the heck it is they're typing in the first place because you can use um, statistical analysis techniques developed originally for cryptography to determine, assuming you know they're typing English text, that, based that a certain frequency of keys will happen in a certain way and map the sound to key and then get 90% of English text, or sorry, 90% accuracy with English text. And once you have the system trained, you can then recognize, given 20 guesses, 90% of all five character passwords, 77% of all eight character passwords, and 70% and of 10 character passwords. It's kind of a problem, especially when you can hijack a computer with a Trojan, start recording the microphone input on the computer, and then listen to all the, all the keystrokes that are happening in the room. For example, the government is a big fan of the idea of segregating networks. This means you have a computer connected to the regular network for people to do their IMing and you know, MySpace stuff on. You have another computer connected to, this, to the top secret network, and the two are never connected. The idea being that anybody who acts into the unsecured computer can't access the secure computer. Well, if the unsecured computer has a microphone on it, you can hear what anybody's typing into the secure computer in the same room, which is kind of a problem. So you might be interested in, in figuring out how to find a bug. This is called, in the industry, technical, surve technical surveillance countermeasures and generally involves hiring very high-priced experts to come in with some esoteric-looking equipment and sweep the room, looking, making beeping noises, and hopefully find the bug. You may be tempted to do this yourself using SpyShop bug finders. These things are universally crap. No, really, don't even bother. The phone line analyzers they sell are totally useless. If you actually want to do this, you might, you might start with this thing called the Spectrum Analyzer for $20,000, $50,000, and it shows you on a, dis on a display all, all the signals in the local area as a form of peaks, where there's a signal, you see a peak. Where there isn't a signal, you don't, you don't see peak. And you can therefore analyze what is there and what shouldn't be there by looking at what's going on in the room radio-wise. The cool thing about a spectrum analyzer is also spots things like frequency hopping or sped, spread spectrum bugs, which you can't spot with your average radio, radio shack scanner because you'll see the, the, the little bit of extra radiation in that area. There are systems like OSCOR, which are sold as like all-in-one TSCM tools for companies that want to do their own in-house stuff. Basically, they work by doing two different things. They will compare the, radio, the local radio spectrum at some previous time to whatever is to, to the radio spectrum whenever there's a secret meeting. The idea being that a bug which is turned off at night to save battery power will be turned back on during the secret meeting, and therefore you'll see that extra spike in the, in the spectrum. And they'll also look at the spectrum and compare it to the local audio. The idea being that there'll be some, that given a, if there's a bug in the room, there'll probably be some correlation between the radio emissions of the bug and the local audio inside the room, and therefore they'll find the bug. A real TSCM specialist will probably walk in with one of these guys. It looks like a very fancy metal detector. It's a nonlinear junction detector, and it uses a spectrally pure, generally about two watts of uh, radio frequency emission out, out of the metal detector head that then is what, and then would also act as an antenna. And then there's an audio, there's an RF amplifier and some sophisticated DSP circuitry, which is then looking for odd order harmonics in the return signal. The idea being that any kind of nonlinear linear junction in silicon, which is a junction that you're going to find in any kind of diode or transistor, and therefore in any kind of bug, is going to return an odd order harmonic and therefore locate the bug for you. This is great when you're looking at a wall and you find this kind of junction in the middle of a wall that really shouldn't have any kind of junction in it, and you notice know our digging. It isn't so great, of course, when you're dealing with something that already has electronics around you, like, say, your average server room. So you need someone other, other 
technology to go after that. So it's one, one tool in the toolkit. The other problem with these non-linear non junction detectors is that they will detect rust on screws, for example, which form their own non-linear junctions. They'll detect the springs in a car. They'll detect any bit of metal in, a fur in furniture because of corrosion. So false positives are kind of a big problem. Voiceover, just about anything. This is what I was telling you about earlier with the Radio Shack intercoms. A lot of bugs are designed to run in place forever. They run off wall power and they transmit the audio down the power line so that you can pick it up by plugging in the receiver into anything on the same circuit. And if they're well designed, they'll run in just about the 50, 50 kilohertz to you know, a couple hundred kilohertz range so they don't get filtered out by filtering which is applied to the power line which means to detect them, you use a high, an HF band ham radio receiver. If you have access to a thermal imager, you can take advantage of the fact that a lot of radio transmi transmitters give off heat, a lot of, ha a lot of cameras give off heat. So if you see a hot spot where there shouldn't be one, you should probably take a look. Most important of all in TSCM though is physical, secure, physical search, taking the room apart piece by piece, looking everywhere. This is probably the easiest to do because all you need to do is use some elbow grease. It'll find the most bugs of any, of any different method because you're looking for the physical bug, but you have to be particularly thorough. In fact, you should probably check the car and the home. There have been some high profile cases, for example, where the Scottish politician Ter Tommy Sheridan discovered a tiny little uh, box with what he described as a wee antenna on it in his car, which was presumably recording his cell phone calls because, well, GSM is pretty difficult to intercept unless you have about $100,000. It's pretty easy to listen in on when someone's talking and what do people do in their cars? They talk on their cell phones. Did it with their home. The CEO of the UK uh, insurance company, Equitable Life, found a bug in the apartment he used during the week and that caused a big hoopla, which means that he got to hire a very expensive TSCM specialist. These guys charge several thousand dollars a day because the amount of equipment they quote about is 200,000, two, 200, $2 million altogether. The reason you want to spend that much is because sometimes things go wrong like the time Kid Rock's entourage, security entourage, found what they thought was a wireless camera in his dressing room, thereby you know, uploading porn of Kid Rock getting dressed to the random internets. Well, it turns out this wireless camera was actually part of the of nightclub's regular security system. The, lo the resulting lawsuit backfired horribly and everybody was very embarrassed. If you want to try it yourself, of course, you can go down to Radio Shack and buy yourself a scanner and listen to all the local transmissions and see if you can find something which is picking up audio in the, in the target room. This will, of course, only detect the most rudimentary bugs like the ones I showed you earlier, the, the bug in the uh, hair dryer, bug in the birdhouse type deal, which, of course, would never gonna, is never going to be used against a high-value target like, say, the Porsche CEO who found a baby monitor under the sofa in his Rich Carlton hotel room. He, he was very infuriated by this because it was on, the batteries were fresh. They went to the Ritz-Carlton guys and they were like, oh, it must be a, a family. But then they checked their records and no family had actually stayed in the hotel room for several weeks before. So some idiot was trying to bug the Porsche CEO with the baby monitor. That's all I've got for you right now. This is probably bringing a lot of relief to the deaf card people who've been waving at me. If you have any questions, there's no microphone system, but you're welcome to come up and ask.